بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين We begin as we begin all of our lectures with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by sending salutations upon the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent as a mercy to all mankind and upon his family and his companions and all those who follow them until the last day. I'd like to start first of all by just uh, saying Jazakallahu Khairan or Jazakumullahu Khairan to all of you first of all for attending. It's the first time I've been all the way up to Aberdeen. Uh, certainly the first I've been up north in the UK uh, in delivering a lecture. And mashallah tabarakallah, it's really nice to see the hall is packed out. A lot of people have given up uh, some of their time to hear, to come and, and to listen to this inshallah. So that's a nice thing to see. And also to say Jazakumullahu Khaira to the brothers and the sisters who organized the talk here today, who gave up all of their efforts and their time to organize this. So inshallah we should begin by thanking them based on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the one who doesn't thank the people does not really thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The brother already gave you an introduction to who I am. And the only thing that I want to add to that is a little bit about why I'm talking to you about this particular topic. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Islamic University of Medina, uh, the topic of the jinn and black magic is not part of the syllabus. So the question might come, well, how did you end up delivering many lectures on this topic? Uh, the answer to that is that I began as a, a Raqi, or I began as a person treating people with the Qur'an for various problems that they had. And I began this in about 2006, when a friend of mine in Newcastle came to me with a problem regarding his sister. And he said, look, I want your advice. And I don't know, you know, she's been to the doctor time and time again and they can't find anything wrong with her. She's very severely ill. It's getting worse and worse by the day. She's on loads of medication. She's just moving from department to department. They don't know what's wrong with her. And do you know anything about whether this might be gin related, whether this might be something to do with magic? And at that time, I didn't really know a lot about it. And I said to him, you know, I don't really know a lot about this, but I intend to find out, inshallah. So I went back to Medina and I sought out some people or someone with the relevant knowledge in this field. I had an understanding as I think all Muslims have an understanding that the jinn exist and we're going to come on to talk a lot about that in a moment. But I had a very vague understanding that the jinn existed. I had a vague understanding that there may be times when the world of the jinn and the world of human beings collides and that may produce effects in people that are undesirable. I had this kind of vague idea, but in terms of the specifics, I really didn't know a great deal. So what I did is I ended up seeking advice from one of the shuyukh, one of the, the senior scholars in Medina, Sheikh Ali ibn Ghazi at Tawajiri, who he himself is a former Raqi, somebody who treats people with the Quran. He's also a professor at the Islamic University of Medina and a lecturer in the Prophet's Masjid. And I sought the advice of the Shaykh. I said to him, what do you think? You know, should I go and should I recite Quran on this, on this woman or not? And he essentially said to me two things. He said to me, Muhammad, you need two things. He said, I think inshallah your belief is okay. You understand what it means to believe what belief is as a Muslim and you've tried to implement that. He said, you need two things. He said, you need to be able to recite the Quran. And he said, you need to be able to be patient when very, very strange things happen to you. And you need to be able to be patient in the face of a lot of adversity and difficulty. 
And he said, if you think that you can find those two qualities in yourself, that you're able to recite the Qur'an, and that you're able to be patient in the face of quite severe adversity, then, then you can go and, and you should go and recite on this woman. As it happened, I, I went in the end and I recited and a lot of very strange things happened. A lot of even stranger things have happened since. And I kept on going back to the Shaykh and advising him and he kept on advise, advising me with the same thing to remain patient, to be from the people who, uh, who seek help in patience, seek help in the prayer. Like Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa salah. Inna Allah ma'as sabirin. O you who believe, seek the help of Allah through being patient and through the prayer. And indeed Allah is with those people who are patient. And so that kind of was the beginning. Like any of you will know, if any of you are involved in Rukia or any of you have an idea of getting involved in dealing with this kind of thing, that once you start, it doesn't stop. It's like opening the floodgates. Once it starts with one person, the next time you look, you have 10 people and then 100 people, and then it just keeps on going and going. So since about 2006, I've been treating people uh, for jinn-related problems and treating people with the Qur'an. Since then, uh, I've had the chance to spend some time with a very, very interesting individual, a very noble sheikh and a very interesting individual. And he actually came up to, uh, he came up to Glasgow, I believe, uh, for a talk, and that is Sheikh Adil ibn Tahir al muqbil And some of you may have attended his talk. I think he gave a talk in Glasgow, which I translated. Um, and this talk, it may, I can't remember if it was in Edinburgh or in Glasgow, but he gave a talk and I translated it. And the Sheikh, his job is essentially, he, is, he works with the General Presidency for the promotion of virtue and the prevention of vice in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and his job is essentially to chase down people who are involved in sorcery and black magic and to find those individuals and to work with the police in arresting them and bringing them to justice. So he has a lot of interesting stories and I got to spend a, a full week with him traveling around the country and, and learning from him as well. At the moment, I lecture around the UK on a wide variety of topics. I don't just talk about the jinn and sorcery and things like that, but this is obviously a topic that is, uh, it's, a lot of people want to hear about it, and a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions around it, and hopefully today, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be able to clear up a number of those uh, misconceptions. Uh, at the moment, the best way for those of you who want to get in touch later on, or you want to get some more information on this topic, admittedly in an hour we're only going to be able to cover a certain limited amount of information is to go via my website which is muhammadtim.com which is spelled muhammad is spelled with a u and an a as in m u h a w m a d muhammadtim.com and on there inshallah you have contact details and you have all sorts of articles on the jinn and on ruqya and on black magic and video links and all sorts of things like that before we begin the main topic of the lecture today, I always begin my lectures, or at least I try to always begin my lectures which relate to these issues by talking a little bit about the unseen. The unseen which we call in Arabic al-ghaib. Now the unseen is a very, or belief in the unseen, is a very fundamental characteristic of a Muslim. And that's why at the very beginning of the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah, just after the opening Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the successful people. He says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ The very beginning of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the successful people. He says, this is the book in which there is no doubt, a guidance for those people who fear Allah. Those people are those who believe in the unseen. So the very first characteristic of the people who believe in Allah, the very first characteristic of the people who are successful, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدًا مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ these are the people upon guidance from their Lord. These are the successful people. The very first thing Allah describes them with, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ Those people who believe in the unseen. 
Now the unseen is a very, very general word and it covers a lot of things. The very first thing belief in the unseen covers for a Muslim is belief in Allah. Because we can't see Allah and we can't test for Allah. We can't, you know, bring a test tube and if it turns green then Allah exists and if it turns red then He doesn't. We don't have any scientific means in that sense. But what we have is the ayat of Allah, the evidences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent His messengers and we have our natural inclination to worship God. We have plenty of evidence there, but belief in Allah is from belief in the unseen. Likewise, if you look at the pillars of, of Iman, the pillars of belief for a Muslim, and tu'mina billah, that you believe in Allah, wa malaikatihi, and that you believe in the angels, we can't see the angels. And currently scientific thought doesn't hold the existence of the angels to be true. This is a matter of the unseen, a matter which we believe in firmly. We believe in these creatures which are angels that we can't see. And we believe that there is not even a space equal to a hand span in the heavens or the earth except that there is an angel prostrating to Allah or remembering Allah in that space. So this belief in the angel is from the belief or this belief in the angels is from our belief in the unseen. Likewise, our belief in the prophets that we haven't met, the prophets that we haven't heard from, the prophets that we don't have their scripture available to us, those prophets who they talked about them in the Qur'an, those prophets who perhaps the Muslims have a unique belief about them. Again, this is from the belief in the unseen. That scripture which we have lost, which has no longer been preserved like the Torah and the Injil in their original form, the Torah and the Gospel in their original form. Again, because we don't have it in front of us, this becomes from our belief in the unseen. Our belief in the last day is from our belief in the unseen, that we will be resurrected after we die, that we will be either given uh, blessings and bliss and happiness in our graves or punishment and torment. These are all from our belief in the unseen. So believing in things that we can't see through the evidences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, through the signs of Allah, through the ayat of the Qur'an, through the speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through what we have been told and what we have understood from Islamic law and Islamic scripture, there are a number of things that we believe about the unseen and this is a very fundamental characteristic of a believer. And this leads me to a very very important point which you're going to need throughout the whole of this lecture. And that is that our only source of knowledge about the unseen is the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because this or these matters of the unseen that we can't know except through the Islamic texts, they are from the knowledge of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that Allah has alone. And therefore we can only take that knowledge from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, i.e. from the Qur'an, or from what Allah has revealed to His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Sunnah. So we have the Qur'an and we have the sayings and the actions and the approval and the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which comprises his, his Sunnah. So we have the Qur'an and we have the Sunnah. And that is the only place that we can get this knowledge of the unseen. We can't take it from dreams. We can't take it from so-called holy people who claim to have knowledge of the unseen. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, Say, O Muhammad, I do not tell you that I have the depositories of Allah or that I know the unseen, nor that do I tell you that I am an angel. I only follow what is revealed to me. Say, is the blind equivalent to the one who sees? Then will you not give thought? So in this, the Prophet Sallallahu is commanded to say to the people, say to them that you do not hold the provision of Allah. You're not the one that holds and gives out the provision of Allah. Nor do you know the unseen. The only thing you know is what is revealed to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you tell the people. Otherwise, you, O Muhammad, have no knowledge of the unseen more than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to you. And that is why in the famous hadith of Jibreel, when Jibreel came and he asked the angel Gabriel, he came alayhi salam and he asked the Prophet sallallahu when will the hour be? The Prophet ﷺ replied, the one who is asking or the one who is being asked 
has no more knowledge about this than the one who is asking. I.e. I don't know and you don't know. Because that knowledge is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there's no doubt in the field of the jinn, the jinn are from the unseen. And th therefore the majority or the, the f fundamentals of our knowledge about the jinn, they have to come from the Qur'an and from the authentic statements of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, there's no doubt that we, to a certain degree, interact with the jinn in various situations or the jinn interact with us in various situations and we do come across them and we do experience them and therefore experience can be used to suggest something but I want you to distinguish very clearly between the things we learn from experience or the things that are theories or that are suggested by various people regardless of their expertise and between what is authentically reported in the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet so what comes from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we don't have an opinion about it, we don't have a second decision over it, we don't say what do you think and what does he think and what does she think. When it comes from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey, that's it. مَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَادَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرَ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It's not for a believing man or a believing woman. When Allah and His Messenger decree something that they should have any opinion about the matter. You don't have the right to an opinion after the Qur'an speaks about something and you don't have the right to an opinion after the Sunnah or the Prophet ﷺ speaks about something. As for my opinion and your opinion, we can debate it. I might be wrong, you might be right. You might be wrong, I might be right. We can talk about things we think might be true or might not be true. But at the end of the day, we want to distinguish between what clearly comes from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and those things we have no doubt over and no discussion over and no debate over and those things that they come from theory and they come from experience. And I can say, well, you know, in the last you know, nine years or eight years, I've experienced this number of things and this leads me to believe this. That's something you can bear in mind, but you, feel, you can feel free to agree or to disagree with something that comes from my experience. But we must be very careful to stick within the limits of those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about. Just to give us an introduction to the topic, the word jinn is clearly an Arabic word. <clears throat> and perhaps not all of you are, I presume not all of you are familiar with the Arabic language. So the word jinn is an Arabic word and it's, it's been brought into English. Um, generally, the word genie in English is a, a derivative or a, it's taken from the word jinn in Arabic. And you sometimes even see the word jinn written in English. It's, it's a word that is used in English. But in Arabic, the root letters jim and then a double noon. So J-N-N, -N, anything with J-N-N -N in that order. For those of you who know Arabic, you know it's based upon root letters and those root letters form different words. Um, those three letters together, they generally relate to things that are concealed. So for example, you have the janin, which is the fetus in the womb. So something which is concealed from somebody. You also have the word junoon, which means insanity, but it literally means to conceal the intellect or to conceal the mind. So things that are concealed or hidden in general from the site are known in or are referred to in Arabic with these three letters a jim, a noon and a noon, a j, an n and an n and therefore we know that the jinn likewise relate to something that are or something that is unseen the word jinn is actually a plural the singular of which is jinni so there is one jinni and multiple jinn so the word jinn is, uh, is a plural word and if we want a brief definition, and this isn't a very technical definition, but just to give you an idea about what we're talking about today, the jinn are a type of created being. So they are not themselves creators or gods besides Allah, they are a created being. Just like Allah has created us and Allah has created the animals and Allah has created the birds and Allah has created the fish. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created another type of being which are called the jinn. And something that is very peculiar or very special about this particular type of creation as opposed to all of the other animals is that like human beings, the jinn are an intelligent form of life. So they are not uh, like uh, wild animals that have no uh, intellect, that have no sort of 
uh, ability uh, in that regard. They have intellect and more than that and more significant than that, they have free will. So like human beings, they have the ability to choose right from wrong. They are promised paradise if they choose that which is right and they are threatened with hellfire if they choose that which is wrong and they are required to submit to Allah in Islam as is the rest of humankind. So they are different from human beings. They're a type of creation and they have intellect and free will and like us, they are required to follow Islam. If they follow it properly and implement it, they are promised paradise and if they turn away from it and reject it, they're threatened with the hellfire. So they're very similar to human beings in many different ways. So we're going to begin by talking about the physical uh, and the sort of characteristics and attributes of the jinn as much as we know them. So we'll begin with the creation of the jinn. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, the angels were created from light and the jinn were created from a smokeless fire and Adam or Adam was created from that which has been described to you. So we know in the Quran that human beings came from originally three things that are mentioned in the Quran. Originally they came from Turab, so they came from dust or dirt and the Turab was mixed with water and the water and the dirt came together to form clay and from this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam. From this Allah created Adam. So Allah created the first human being. As for the jinn, they were not created in this way. So they are not physically similar to human beings. They are not the same as us. They were created from a smokeless fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and the jinn we created them before from scorching fire. samum, <laughs> From a scorching burning fire. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Rahman, and he created the jinn from a smokeless flame of fire. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about what this means. He said a smokeless flame of fire means the edge of the flame and in another report he said it means the best and the purest and the hottest part of the flame. How did Allah create them from the flame? How did that flame form an intelligent being? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Get used to saying this phrase a lot because it is half of knowledge as Al-Imam Malik rahimahullah said, half of knowledge is saying you don't know. When you claim to have an answer for everything, it's very easy to pull your arguments apart. When you say, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create them? We don't know any more than this. We know they were created from fire. We know they were created from a burning, scorching fire. We know that they were created from a fire that was smokeless. It didn't have any smoke. We know that Ibn Abbas tells us that it was the edge or the hottest part of the flame. And we know that they were created in that way. And from there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them and their creation continued. But just like us today, I mean, if you wipe your arms, you don't get clay on it, right? So even though you were created from clay or you were created from dirt and water together, you don't find that within you now because the creation has changed and developed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has molded it in the way that he saw fit to mold it. And so we are different from our origin. <clears throat> I mean, even scientifically, we can agree that the, uh, upon the origin of water. But even though every animal has its origins in water, as Allah Azza wa Jal says that we created every living being from water, then not every living animal has a watery characteristic. And likewise, the jinn were created from fire. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are balls of hot flame that move around from place to place. In fact, we know that they aren't. And the reason we know that they aren't is a hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, which is narrated by Imam al-Nasai in As-Sunan al-Kubara and in Sahih ibn Hibban, that Aisha radiallahu anha, she reported that the Prophet sallallahu was praying and then a shaitan came to him. A jinn or a jinni came to him. And the Prophet ﷺ seized hold of that jinni, seized hold of that jinn, threw him to the ground and strangled him. The Prophet ﷺ said, until I felt the coolness of his tongue on my hand. 
Were it not for the prayer of my brother Sulaiman, i.e. Solomon the Prophet, he would have been tied up this morning so the people could see him. And in another narration, he would have been tied up to a pillar in the masjid so that the children could play with him. So in this hadith, what we really want from this hadith is not necessarily the story, but the words until I felt the coolness of his tongue on my hand. What does this tell us? This tells us that even though the jinn were originally created from fire, the, they have the coolness of the tongue and therefore they're clearly not fiery as in balls of fire that move around from place to place or rays of light or anything else that people try to interpret to get away from this concept of believing in the jinn. One very obvious thing that we should state, and we've mentioned this before, but we should really emphasize this, is that of course we can't see the jinn unless they take the form of humans or animals. But they can normally see us. So the kind of the norm is that we can't see them and they can see us. That's the norm. Of course there are exceptions to that. There are times when we may see them in a certain form or another. There's a time when a person may be afflicted by the jinn and they may see the shadows moving or they may see the jinn in one form or another but as for major the majority of the time we can't see them but they can see us what's the evidence for this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about iblis iblis being the the devil or the 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 head of all of the devils and iblis the shaitan or satan Iblis, he, he's talking or Allah is discussing or talking about Iblis in the Quran and he mentions verily he and his tribe, i.e. he and the jinn that are with him, they see you from where you cannot see them. They see you from where you cannot see them. Are they in a different dimension? Are they hidden from us? Are they mixed in with something? Allah knows best. Once we go beyond these limits and we start to talk about things that nobody has any evidence for, this is where we start to fall into real serious problems. But when we stick with the Quran, Allah says, Verily, He and His tribe and His people, they see you and you don't see them. That's enough for us. We don't need to go beyond that. As for this discussion about the jinn inhabit a world which has another dimension and there are portals that they move through and back and forth, this is all, these are all statements that are made without any knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in general criticizes in the Quran when people speak without knowledge. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith narrated by al-Hakim and al-Tabarani and al-Bayhaqi narrated about three kinds of jinn. He said there are three types of jinn one type flies through the air, another type consists of snakes and dogs, and a third type is based in one place but travels about. Again, there is a lot of discussion about this hadith. And there are some things that we can say very definitively. First of all, the question comes, are these three types the only three types of jinn? Some of the scholars say that the Quran and the Sunnah mention more than these. So these are an example of three types of jinn. But what I want you to take from this hadith, notice how there are three different types that the Prophet ﷺ talks about. And notice how the three have different characteristics and different abilities. So notice one flies through the air. The implication is that one flies through the air and the other one doesn't fly through the air. One consists of snakes and dogs. This doesn't say that every snake and dog is a jinn. But it says that amongst or there are some jinn that take the forms of the form of snakes and dogs. A third type is based in one place but travels about. So different characteristics that are given for different kinds of jinn. And this will help you a lot. Because when it comes to dealing with the jinn, the first mistake that people make is they make all of the jinn like one. With the same abilities and the same uh, you know characteristics and you know they're they they react to the same things and they're affected by the same things and they all dislike the same thing and they all like the same thing that's not true experience and this hadith as well as experience tells us that the jinn are all different they have different abilities different characteristics they do different things they like different things they dislike different things The jinn are not inherently evil. This is a mistake Muslims tend to make. 
more so than non-Muslims because of the word shaitan or Satan. And the word shaitan or Satan in Arabic is very much associated with the jinn. And so what happens is Muslims tend to have an idea that all of the jinn are evil. All of the jinn are shayateen. We have just heard in the recitation of Surah Al-Jinn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, quoting the jinn, and of us are those who are Muslim, and some of us are disbelievers. And whoever has embraced Islam, then those are the ones who have sought the right path. And as for those who deviated, they shall be the firewood for the hellfire. So in this we hear in this passage that there are jinn who are Muslim and there are jinn who are not Muslim. Amongst the non-Muslims, there are jinn that are fairly kind and fairly sympathetic towards Islam, just like you find many non-Muslims who are very kind and sympathetic towards Islam. And there are jinn who are absolutely vehemently and aggressively against Islam, just like there are human beings who are the same. So just like you get a wide variety of human beings over from your, you know, your crazy far-right extremists all the way to your sort of you know, uh, Muslims and you have all sorts of different religions and different types of people. Likewise, the jinn are of many different types. Like Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Jinn, Kunna tara'iqa qidada. We are of many, many different types. We are follow many different ways. So just like human beings follow many different ways and paths and religions, and they have their sort of opinion or their stance regarding Islam, either they are you know, pro-Islam or they're against Islam or they're quite neutral, likewise the jinn are the same. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is a shaitan? A shaitan or a Satan in Arabic is essentially a devil. But a devil can be a human devil or it can be a devil from the jinn. And it refers to the one who is rebellious and arrogant and evil amongst both groups of people. So someone whose evil and whose arrogance and whose rebellion reaches such a, a huge level, this is a shaitan. Whether or not they are from the jinn or whether or not they are from or whether, the, whether they are from the jinn or whether they are from mankind. So not every jinn is a shaitan and not every shaitan is a jinn. Having said that, when you hear the word shaitan mentioned in general, immediately the general reference is to the jinn. So when you hear the word Satan mentioned or shaitan mentioned or the devil mentioned in uh, in Arabic or in Islam or related to Islam, then that is generally referring to the jinn, generally. However, it's not exclusively referring to the jinn. Not every jinn is a devil and not every devil is a jinn. From experience, not so much from the sunnah, but from experience we get the impression that the jinn are very quick to get angry and very impetuous. They're very difficult to reason with any of you who perform ruqya or any of you who have had a problem with the jinn or an interaction with the jinn in the past will know the jinn are very, very difficult to reason with. They're very, very impetuous. They're very, very quick to uh, get angry and quick to jump to conclusions and very, very hard to calm down. Messengers were, of course, sent to the jinn just like they were sent to mankind. Allah Azza wa Jal says, we certainly sent to every nation a messenger saying, worship Allah and avoid all those that are worshipped besides Allah. As for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was sent to both the jinn and the humans. At the very beginning of Surah Al-Jinn we hear, say, O Muhammad, it has been revealed to me that a group of the jinn listened and said, indeed we have heard an amazing Quran. It guides to the right path and we have believed in it and we will never associate anyone with our Lord. This tells us that the Quran was revealed to the jinn as it was revealed to the humans and that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam was sent as a messenger to the alameen, to all of the worlds, the jinn and the men. The jinn and the men. We also know that the jinn have their own world, their own living places and that they in terms of our world, they often inhabit unclean or deserted places, places that are far away from human sort of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, or a lot of humans living there, or they, they inhabit places that are often very unclean or very dirty. Having said that, of course, the jinn live among us, 
and we know that some animals can see the jinn. In Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if you hear the crowing of the rooster, then ask Allah for his bounty, for it has seen an angel. And if you hear the braying of a donkey, then seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan, for it has seen a shaitan, a devil. So in this, the Prophet sallallahu who is the one who is receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the crowing of the rooster, it has a reason and a purpose and the braying of a donkey, it has a reason and a purpose. Whether we see that today or we know that today or not, that doesn't matter. Because as Muslims, we believe in the unseen. We believe in what was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one of the most wonderful things about Islam is that Islam does not contradict the sound intellect and Islam does not contradict what we know about the world but Islam gives us information that we don't have from elsewhere so we didn't know this uh, from our research or from science but the Prophet ﷺ told us that if you hear the crowing of the rooster then ask Allah for his bounty for it has seen an angel and if you hear the braying of a donkey then seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan for it has seen a devil and Abu Dawood narrated from Jabir ibn Abdullah that the Prophet ﷺ said, if you hear the barking of a dog or the braying of a donkey, then seek refuge with Allah, for they see that which you do not see. And again, this is general, that it mentions all the things that you don't see. They see shapes that you don't see, they see things that you don't see, they see objects that you don't see, but they also see the shaitan or they see the jinn when you can't see the jinn. So the Prophet ﷺ indicated that both donkeys and dogs are able to see the jinn in certain circumstances. Allah knows best how many of those circumstances or in what time or in what way. But we know that when, they, when the dog barks or when the donkey brays, we are taught in Islam to seek refuge with Allah because they see things that we haven't seen. Continuing on our introduction to the characteristics of the jinn. The jinn are required to follow the laws of Allah. They are promised paradise and threatened hellfire depending on their actions in this world. The jinn have certain abilities which may appear to us to be supernatural. And this is where we start to delve into the realm of the, the paranormal a little bit. And that is that the jinn clearly have abilities that we, that to us appear to be supernatural. And this is where you get sort of the supernatural and the paranormal and, you know, the lights flick on and off and the doors open and the windows open. There's nobody there and you see a little girl who no one's ever seen before wandering through the, the hallway and all of these different things. And inshallah, you won't sleep tonight. <laughs> well, if I told you half of the things I had seen, you would not sleep for a week. But subhanallah. But alhamdulillah. But the thing is that the jinn do have abilities that seem to us to be supernatural. But I want to actually get you away from thinking in this way. I want you to actually stop thinking of the jinn as all-powerful, supernatural, incredible beings. At the end of the day, when you see many different animals, you think that, and, and they have an ability that you don't have. You know, you, you see the, the greatness of Allah and the creation of Allah, but it doesn't surprise you. When I tell you birds fly through the sky, you don't, you know, you don't get nightmares for you know, three, four days. When I tell you that fish swim to the depths of the sea, you know, it doesn't terrify you. So you shouldn't be surprised that there is a creation from the creation of Allah that is able to do these things. You know, they're able, some of them are able to fly, but the birds can fly, so that's no big deal. Some of them are able to uh, sort of take different forms, and that's something that is, you know, different for us. But again, it's simply what Allah has given them the ability to do and we see certain animals that are able to change their color able to change their shape to a certain degree that are able to camouflage themselves and again this is something from the creation of Allah and it makes us recognize the greatness of God and the creation of God but it doesn't necessarily terrify us and it doesn't make us you know uh, fall into you know paranoia and various other things so we should be very careful with the jinn that when it comes to the jinn we recognize they are simply a creation from the creation of Allah. Just like the other creation that Allah has created, they have some things that they can do that we can't do, and there are some things that we can do that they can't do. So it seems to us that, you know, there are these abilities, but not all of the jinn seem to be able to have all of these abilities, and Allah knows best. 
Another thing that I want to get away from is a concept that the jinn are naturally aggressive towards human beings. In all of my experience of the jinn, I would say the opposite is true. And this is not just experience, but there is a hadith to back this up. And this is a hadith telling about the story of Quraysh, the Arab tribes who lived just before the coming of the Prophet Muhammad When those Arab tribes would send an army to conquer another town, they would enter into various valleys and climb various mountains. Whenever they would descend into a valley, the jinn in the valley, the Prophet ﷺ told us, the jinn in the valley would flee. And that's normal. It's a normal reaction of a lot of animals, right? You know, just generally, you know, if you come across a big army, even human beings, you come across, you know, you're sat sort of in your little tent camping somewhere out in the, you know, the, the park and a huge army of people heavily armed, you know, sort of storming their way towards your tent you're likely to get up and run. And that is the reaction of the jinn. However, what did these tribes used to do? They would settle themselves and camp in the base of the valley. And then they would raise up their hands and they would start to call and supplicate to the jinn. And this is something that is almost universally accepted in every culture, that there have been people in every culture, in every religion who have worshipped the spirits, the jinn, the dead, whatever you want to call it, they have worshipped the jinn. And some of them have worshipped them, believing them to be angels, as Allah tells us in the Quran, when, it will, they, when Allah will come to the angels and say to the angels, was it these people, was it you that these people used to worship? And Allah will say to them, no, it wasn't us that they used to worship. Most of them used to worship the jinn. It was them who they believed, it was they who they believed in, or it was them who they believed in. So we see that throughout many cultures, and there are as many examples of this in Christianity and Judaism and Hinduism and Buddhism as any as there are in Islam, of people who sought help and sought to call upon the spirits, call upon the jinn. So what used to happen when those jinn who had fleed from the oncoming army used to hear the people calling upon them and supplicating to them and asking them for help, then they would realize that these people had a fear of them. And once they sensed that fear in you, they would attack. And they would attack them, they would pelt them with stones, they would pelt them with fire, they would set their tents alight. And what would happen is, obviously, those people would be increased in their supplication because they would think, oh, these are really great spirits, powerful beings that can do so much to us. In reality, they were running away, but when they showed a fear of them, they drew them back. And this is a very, very important point. And really, if this is the only thing you take away today, it's a worthwhile uh, you know, use of your time, inshallah, for you to understand that the jinn do not deserve to be feared. And as soon as you show them fear, they will take maximum advantage of the fear that you show them. As soon as you start to show them fear, they will play with you, they will pull out all the tricks. I'm talking about the windows will open, the lights will go on and off, the human beings start appearing left, right and center, things start floating, knives start flying, pots and pans start going across the room. This is when you show them fear. When you don't show them fear, when you show them that you understand that they are simply a created being, you know, if they throw a pan across the room, I'd be tempted to pick the pan up and throw it back and say, you can throw the pan, I can throw the pan. As soon as you do this, they will stop messing around generally and they will stop causing you, you know, these kind of creepy paranormal type things that happen. Generally, they happen when people give them more respect than they deserve. They are intelligent beings at the end of the day. They have an ability to think. And therefore, when they see that you're terrif terrified and scared of them, they are going to play on that. They're going to play pranks with you. They're going to joke with you. They're going to cause you all of these various paranormal experiences and these various sort of things that happen, haunted houses and all the rest. And in general, I have to say that since I've started doing Rukia, I get very little of these kind of paranormal crazy things going on. Every now and again, you know, I might get one person in 50 levitate off the ground. In general, most people don't. But the reason is that when you don't show them that fear and you don't show them that, you know, reverence, then they don't cause you as many problems. So we want people to stop fearing the jinn 
as though they are these all-powerful spirits that can touch you from anywhere. Because this is going to take a person outside of Islam. When you fear them, like, you des like God deserves to be feared, like Allah deserves to be feared, then you're going to end up leaving Islam. You're going to end up uh, making a partner with Allah. And that's what Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran. He mentions it in Surah Al-Jinn and he mentions it in uh, Surah Al-An'am. So Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentions the interaction between the jinn and human beings. So Allah says, and mention O Muhammad the day when he will gather them together and say, O company of jinn, you have misled many of mankind. And their allies among mankind will say, Our Lord, some of us you made use of others. Some of us made use of others. And we have now reached our term that you appointed for us. He will say the fire is your residence. You will abide therein forever except for what Allah wills. And indeed your Lord is wise and knowing. So in this we see people interacting with, a, with the jinn in a way that is not permissible. People using the jinn. People interacting with the jinn in order to command them or to control them. What will happen? Allah will say to those jinn, you misled a lot of mankind by this false sort of interaction that happens between men and between jinn. And the man, their allies from mankind will say, well, we made use of them and they made use of us. We all made use of each other. We used them and they used us. And we're going to hear a little bit about how the jinn use people and how people use the jinn a little bit later on in the lecture. And then Allah Azza wa Jal will command all of them to be thrown into the hellfire. And Allah Azza wa Jal say, tells us in Surah Al-Jinn, and there were men from mankind who sought refuge in men from the jinn and they only increased them in burden. In another translation of the Quran, they only increased them in sin and transgression. So this interaction with the jinn and this fear and reverence of the jinn and supplicating to the jinn and calling upon the spirits and so on and so forth, it doesn't lead to anything good. It misguides you and it misguides those jinn and those jinn end up being a reason for you and them to be thrown into the hellfire. Likewise, with, when it comes to fear of the jinn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Qur'an, this is only the shaytan, this is only Satan or the devil, who makes you fear his allies, i.e. he makes you scared of the jinn who are with him, so that you have some sort of fear of him, so that you have some sort of reverence of him. He makes you fear his allies. Do not fear them, but fear me, i.e. fear Allah, if you are really believers. So this is a clear command in the ayah, not to fear the jinn, not to fear the shaitan, not to fear the enemies of Islam or those people who seek to uh, corrupt Islam from within or from externally or externally. It doesn't matter what people do or what the jinn do or what the jinn try to do to harm you. This is only the shaitan who tries to make you fear his allies. Don't fear them, but fear the one who created them if you are really believers. Don't fear them, but fear Allah if you are really believers. So if we want real iman and real belief, we don't fear the shaitan, we don't fear the jinn, but we fear the one who created the jinn and the one who is capable of protecting us from the jinn. As for the shayateen from the jinn, the disbelievers from amongst the jinn, they have a very ugly appearance. They don't have a very nice appearance. And we don't know a full appearance of them. I've met many patients who describe the jinn to me. Um, I've met many people who have seen the jinn in various different forms. But I'm going to only quote you what Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about the jinn in their appearance or about the evil beings from amongst the jinn. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Safat, إِنَّهَا شَجَرَةٌ تَخْرُجُ فِي أَصْلِ الْجَحِيمِ Allah Azzawajal tells us about the tree that grows from the base of the hellfire. The tree of Zakum. The tree which is Ta'amun Athim, which is a very painful and an evil tree. And Allah describes the fruit of the tree of the hellfire and says it looks like the heads of devils. 
So if you imagine this horrible tree, this horrible poisonous evil tree, and you imagine that it looks like the heads of the shaitan, you can imagine that these shayateen are not particularly uh, uh, nice in appearance. And we also have a hadith of Umar from the Prophet ﷺ that he said, do not pray when the sun is rising or when it is setting, because it rises between the two horns of the shaitan. So we know that the shaitan, or at least some of the shayateen are horned, they have two horns, and we know that their heads are like the tree of Zakum, that horrible, evil, uh, corrupt and withered tree. So if you imagine a horrible fruit from a horrible tree that's filthy and corrupt and poisonous, then this is kind of how Allah describes to us the heads uh, of the shaitan. What about the food and drink of the jinn? The jinn, including the shaitan, they eat and drink, just like human beings eat and drink. In Sahih al-Bukhari from the hadith of Abu Hurairah, the Prophet wasallam commanded Abu Hurairah to bring him some stones to use to clean himself with. And the Prophet wasallam said to him, do not bring me bones or dung. Abu Hurairah asked why. The Prophet wasallam said they are the food of the jinn. A delegation of the jinn came to me and what good jinn they are. And they asked me for provision. I prayed to Allah for them and asked that they should not pass by any bone or any dung, but they would find food on it. So the bones and the dung, particularly the bones that have been eaten and the name of Allah has been mentioned over them, are food for the, our brothers from the jinn, the good jinn, those people who came to the Prophet Wasallam and they asked him to supplicate to Allah to give them provision. So he prayed to Allah that they should not pass by any bone or any dung, but they would find food on it. And in Sunan al-Tirmidhi from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, that the Prophet sallallahu said, do not use dung or bones to clean yourselves, for they are the provision of your brothers among the jinn. And this seems to indicate that this food is only for the believers among the jinn and Allah azza wa jal knows best. Also in the hadith of Sahih Muslim, from the narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, that the Prophet ﷺ said, a caller from among the jinn came to me and I went, it, or I went with him and recited Quran to them. Ibn Mas'ud said, he took us and showed us their footsteps and the traces of their fires. They asked him for provision and he said, you will have every bone over which the name of Allah has been mentioned. When it falls into your hands, it will have plenty of meat on it. And all of, your, all of the droppings or all of animal dung is food for your animals. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not use bones and dung to clean yourselves after using the toilet, for they are the food of your brothers. So it seems here there's more detail that the food that has had Allah's name mentioned on it, when it falls into the hands of the jinn, it becomes covered again in meat that they eat. And likewise, the dung of animals is the food for the animals of the jinn and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We also know that shaitan eats with his left hand, that the evil jinn, they eat with their left hand from the hadith of, in Sahih Muslim, from the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, that the Prophet sallallahu said, when any one of you eats, let him eat with his right hand, and when he drinks, let him drink with his right hand. For the shaitan eats with his left hand and drinks with his left hand. And in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, when a man enters his house and mentions Allah upon entering, he says Bismillah when he walks into the house. And he says Bismillah when he eats. He says in the name of Allah when he enters the house and he says in the name of Allah when he eats. The shaitan says there is no place for you to stay and no dinner. This is very important. But this is from the major ways you protect yourself from the shaitan is that you mention God's name when you walk into the house and you mention the name of Allah when you eat. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, when you mention Allah's name when you walk into the house and you mention Allah's name when you eat, then the shaitan says there is no place for you to stay and no dinner. If he enters his house and does not mention Allah upon entering the shaitan stays, you have a place to stay. And if he does not mention the name of Allah when eating, the shaitan says, you have a place to stay and you have dinner. So this is so important that we ourselves develop the habit of eating with our right hand, of entering our house with our right foot, 
of saying Bismillah in the name of Allah when we enter and saying Bismillah in the name of Allah when we eat. This is from the major reasons to be protected from the shaitan. If you don't do this, you're effectively hanging a big welcome banner above your house and saying to the jinn and the shaitan, come in and stay, come in and eat with me. You have to teach this to your children. You have to teach your children from a young age, get them in the habit of saying Bismillah in the name of Allah when they eat. Bismillah when they walk in the house. Otherwise, you are opening the doors of your house to the jinn and the shaitan and offering them a place to stay and a place to eat. Also from the characteristics of the jinn is that they marry and they multiply. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the shaitan has offspring in Surah Al-Kahf. Allah says, will you take him and his descendants, him and his offspring as allies besides me when they are enemies to you? Him and his offspring. So this tells us that the shaitan has children and that the shay shayateen or the devils, they multiply and they have children. Likewise, Allah mentions the Hur al -ayn, the wives of the people of paradise. And when Allah mentions the Hur al -ayn in Surah Rahman, He says, Allah mentions in the Quran, in these palaces, there are women who do not raise their glances, they do not look at other men, they only look at their husbands. And then Allah says, لَمْ يَطَمِثْهُنَّ إِنْسٌ قَبْلَهُمْ وَلَا جَانٌ No man has touched them before, neither has any jinn. No man nor jinn has had intimate relations with them before. And this tells us that the jinn are capable of this particular action and that the jinn are capable of multiplying. Otherwise, this ayah does not make any sense. Allah says, no jinn nor any man has had intimate relations with them before. So this tells us that the jinn, they multiply, they marry and they have children. Qatada, rahimahullah, he said, the children of the shaitan produce offspring, just like the children of Adam produce offspring, but they are greater in number. And this brings us on to the interesting topic of whether or not there are sometimes relationships that develop between the jinn and between human beings. This is something that does happen, and it is something that is at least theoretically possible, and you do come across it in practice, of times when the jinn fall in love with someone from the human, with someone from human beings, and this can happen with either gender, i.e. a male jinn falling, or a male jinni falling in love with a female human, or a, a female jinni falling in love with a male human, I've come across both. Uh, and this is something that there is fair enough, you know, there's a decent amount of evidence for in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this regard. There is a hadith of a marriage that was initiated between the jinn and between a human being. And when the human saw the jinn, they were terrified and they ran away. Uh, and this indicates again that, you know, there can be this relationship that develops. But again, any interaction between humans and between jinn is a bad thing. It's never going to bring you anything good. It's only going to lead to loss and to confusion. And so, you know, this, these things, uh, any kind of interaction in any kind of way with the jinn is to be avoided at all costs. One of the things that the jinn or some of the jinn have the ability to do is to move quickly from one place to another. We hear in, uh, in uh, Surah uh, An-Naml that Allah Azza wa Jal says, an ifrit, an ifrit, a, a very strong jinn, a very powerful jinn, promised Sulaiman that he would bring the, the throne of the Queen of Sheba to him in no longer than it took for a man to rise from his seat. So Sulaiman is in his kingdom, Solomon is in his kingdom. And of course we know Sulaiman was given control over the jinn, something that nobody before him and nobody after him was given. Solomon or Sulaiman was given control over the jinn and this was never given to anyone before him or after him. And Sulaiman, when he had control of the jinn, an Ifrit, a very powerful jinn, a very strong jinn, said to him, he, he said, who is going to bring the throne of the queen to me? And Ifrit from the jinn said, I will bring it to you before a man rises up or before you stand up from your place, i.e. before you finish your 
sitting or gathering before you stand up from your gathering I'll bring you the throne so very fast and very powerful and the ability to move from one place to another can every jinn do this it seems that this is something that is particular to the ifrit something that is particular to this particular kind of jinn we also know of their ability to ascend to the heavens and their relationship with fortune telling and soothsaying in Sahih al-Bukhari from the hadith of Abu Huraira the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when Allah decrees a matter in the heavens the angels beat their wings in submission to what he says with a sound like a chain beating on a rock then when fear is banished from their hearts they say what has your Lord said they say he has said the truth and he is the most high the most great so those who are trying to eavesdrop so now we're talking about the jinn that there are jinn who ascend through space through all the way to the very highest part of the heavens and they try to eavesdrop on what is said to the angels and they are standing one above the other so the Prophet ﷺ explains they are standing in a huge chain one above the other above the other above the other trying to listen to what the angels are saying to each other trying to catch a, a bit of information about something that is going to happen on the earth before it happens so they hear a word and they pass it on to the one that is beneath him like a massive chain of Chinese whispers one to the other to the other all the way down they pass it on and on and on until it reaches the lips of the sorcerer or the soothsayer i.e. the fortune teller or the mystic or the psychic or whatever it is that they part them or they, they package themselves as the way fortune tellers psychics mystic people whatever the way that these guys work is that they hear the ones that of course you get some that are not genuine at all but the ones that actually believe in what they do they are actually listening to the jinn and what happens is the jinn they pass down the information all the way from the heavens until it reaches the sorcerer or the soothsayer sometimes a flaming fire will hit the jinn before he passes it on and sometimes he will pass it on before he is hit and he tells 100 lies along with it then it is said did this fortune teller not tell us on such and such a day that such and such a thing would happen like the fortune teller like those magicians those tv magicians who say i can tell you what you're thinking i can tell you what you're going to do i can tell you where you're going to go in five minutes i can tell you what they do is they use the jinn the jinn give them information about you about who you are about where you're going about what you're doing sometimes the jinn hear something the angels are talking about in the heavens and the jinn bring it to the fortune teller or the soothsayer or the magician and the soothsayer or the magician mixes in 100 lies so in other words 100 times they lie one time they tell the truth or 99 times they lie and 100 the 100th time they tell the truth then when that truth comes you say didn't I read in my horoscope didn't I read that this was going to happen my horoscope said today was going to be a day when I was going to get rich and today I got some money either this is the jinn that have passed this information on or this is simply you know the 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 lies that they mix in with it to the fortune teller or to the soothsayer then it is said did he not tell us such and such on such and such a day that such and such would happen so he is believed for that for that because of that one word that was heard from the heaven and in the hadith of Aisha in Sahih al-Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said the angels speak in the clouds about things that will happen on the earth the devils listen to what is said then they drop that into the ear of the fortune teller like dropping something into a bottle and they add a hundred lies to it of course in the times before the coming of the Prophet wasallam, the jinn would do this frequently but when the Prophet wasallam came one of the signs of the coming of the Prophet wasallam is that the heavens were closed to the jinn and they were protected by shooting stars as again we heard in Surah Al-Jinn and we have sought to reach the heaven but found it filled with powerful guards and burning flames and we used to sit there in positions to listen but whoever listens, whoever listens now will find a burning flame lying in wait for him as for the ability of the jinn to change shape and to take four different forms and to, and to make different shapes then we find this in the hadith of Abu Huraira in Sahih al-Bukhari 
that Abu Huraira was placed as a responsible person over uh, uh, the wealth of the Muslims, the Muslim treasury. Of course, in that time, it wasn't you know electronic things that were passed across the you know in, in banks, but it was you know an, a physical area in which the wealth of the Muslim government was held. Abu Huraira, one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was given responsibility over this area to guard it. And there was a very old man, he came and he stole some of the Muslim wealth. So Abu Huraira caught him and questioned him and he said, I'm a very old man and I have many, many children and I'm, you know, I'm very frail, I'm very poor, let me go. So Abu Huraira said, you know, this is charity wealth, let him go. So he let him go. The second time he came again and he stole wealth. And again, he, he, he gave the same excuse. I'm an old man. I have many children. I have many children to feed. Let me go with this. I won't come back again. So this time the, Abu Huraira came and he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, indeed, he's going to come again. He's going to come a third time. So the third time again, this old man came and he stole from the wealth. So Abu Huraira grabbed him and he said, this time I'm going to take you to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because this is the third time you've stolen this wealth and I'm not going to allow it to pass this time. He said, let me go and I will teach you something. And he taught him that before you go to sleep, read Ayatul Kursi. Read the, state, the passage of the Quran that begins, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. Allahu la ilaha illa hu al-hayyul qayyum. Read this passage of the Quran and you will be given a guardian who will be sent to watch over you to make sure that nothing harms you when you are sleeping. So Abu Huraira let him go and he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asked him about what that man had said. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He has told you the truth even though he is a great liar. That was the shaitan, that was a jinn or that was Iblis or that was a shaitan or one of the shayateen from the from the from the one of the devils from amongst the devils that this was a jinni that had taken the form of a man and he had told Abu Huraira the truth even though he was a great liar even though he was someone who frequently lies he told Abu Huraira the truth about reading Ayatul Kursi we also find this in the hadith of Abu Sa'ib the freed slave of Hisham ibn Zuhra, that he visited Abu Sa'id al-Khudri in his house. And he said, I found him saying, in his, saying his prayer. So I sat down waiting for him to finish the prayer when I heard a stir in the bundles of wood lying in the corner of the house. I looked towards it and I found a snake. I jumped up in order to kill it, but Abu Sa'id al-Khudri made a gesture that I should, I should sit. So you have a, a companion, a student of Abu Sa'id, one of the companions, who comes into his house and he sits down and Abu Sa'id is praying. And when he's praying, they find a snake, a little snake in the corner of the house. He goes up to kill the snake and Abu Sa'id gestures for him to sit down. So he sat down and, and Abu Sa'id finished the prayer. And he pointed to a room in the house and he said, do you see this room? I said, yes. He said, there was a young man amongst us who had been newly wed. We went with Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to participate in the battle of the trench. When a young man in the midday, uh, in the, uh, the, this, uh, he used to seek permission from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to return to his wife. One day he sought permission and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, after granting him permission to go, carry your spear with you for I fear the tribe of Quraidah may harm you. The man took his spear and he came back and he found his wife standing between the two doors. He bent towards her smitten by jealousy and made a dash towards her with a spear in order to stab her. She said, keep your spear away and enter the house until you see what made me come out of the house. He entered and he found a big snake curled up on the bed. He attacked it with the spear and pierced it and then went out having fixed it in the house. But the snake quivered and attacked him and no one knew which of them died first the snake or the young man. We came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we mentioned him and said, supplicate to Allah that that man may be brought back to life. 
Thereupon the Prophet ﷺ said, Ask forgiveness for your companion. And he said, There are in Medina jinn who have accepted Islam. So when you see one of them, warn it for three days. And if they appear before you after that, then kill it for it is a devil. So in this example, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there were certain kinds of snake that appeared and he referred to them as being jinn that had accepted Islam. And he said, if you see a snake in your house, then pronounce a warning to it. I ask it to leave three times or for three days. And then if after that it appears, you may kill it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, snakes are the form into which some of the jinn were transformed, just as some of Bani Israel were transformed into monkeys and pigs. And in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, the shaitan, the shaitan flows through the children of Adam like blood. We know that some of them accepted Islam. And the very last point that I'm going to make on the characteristics of the jinn is that the jinn do not live forever. The jinn die. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Kullu ma alayha fan. Everything that is on this earth is going to die. And Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul mawt. Every single soul is going to taste death. So the jinn do not live forever. They are going to die just like human beings die. How long do they live? Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Uh, there are various different opinions about how long the jinn live for. But we do know that there are no jinn alive today, except for, with the exception of Iblis, that were alive at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Because of a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, a hundred years from this moment, there will be nothing left on the earth that will, there will be nothing or no human being that will be left or no living thing that will be left on the earth alive after a uh, hundred years from this day. So we know that the, there are any jinn that tell you that they are companions of the Prophet Sallallahu any jinn that tell you that they uh, you know, have been alive since the creation of Adam, I would take that with a serious pinch of salt. So now we know what the jinn are, we know a lot about this, the characteristics, the physical nature of the jinn. The question is now, what are the jinn not? We know what the jinn are, what are the jinn not? So the first thing that the jinn are not is the jinn are not the spirits of the dead. It's not your dead granddad come back to earth to tell you about what it's like in heaven. All of those times when you see the medium and the psychic and you see them saying, yeah, there's something, there's a presence in the room. It's, uh, its name is Bob. It's just the jinn. It's the jinn and they are, you know, the jinn are, they're likely, you know, like I said, you show them reverence and they're going to play with you. And of course, you have a qareen with you. Every single person has a jinn or a, every single person has a, uh, a, a shaitan with them or a jinn with them that is trying to misguide them constantly. Now if you imagine that that qareen, that jinn is with you all the time, then you imagine there is this seance going on and there's this medium or this psychic and the medium says, yeah, we've got a presence in the room which is just one of the jinn who has come into the room. What is that jinn going to do? It's going to get as much information from the jinn that are around you. So it's going to find out your name from them. It's going to find out a little bit about you from them. It's going to find out why you came from them. And then it's going to use that to play back to you. You came here, you know, you're looking for an old woman. I think her name is Mary. I think she's old. She died when she was about. And all it is, is it's just the qareen. The jinn that is with you is simply telling the jinn that has come all about your life history. Yeah, his grandmother died when she was 60 and she died like this and she did this and it's simply telling and then that jinn is coming and repeating the information back. There's a very interesting individual who I've uh, had the pleasure to work with a couple of times who's a, a brother, his, his name is, is Michael Hallowell. He's a very prolific author on the topic of the jinn. He wrote most of his books when he was not a Muslim. He's uh, one of the, uh, the most famous uh, paranormal investigators in the UK. He's been all over the UK and indeed abroad in investigating instances of, you know, paranormal activity, haunted houses, all the rest. Michael actually became Muslim when he heard the Islamic position on the jinn. And he said, my whole life, every single thing that I have witnessed as a paranormal investigator, as soon as I heard about the jinn, everything made perfect sense. 
You know, when you see those programs and the sofa is being thrown up in the sky and all these weird things are happening and, you know, they bring in all these people and they say it must be haunted and something is caught on camera, etc, etc. Once you believe in the jinn and you understand the jinn, everything makes perfect sense. How they deceive people, how they convince people they are your dead grandmother, etc, etc, etc. So the jinn are not the spirits of the dead. The jinn are not all powerful and they are not to be feared. The jinn are not fallen angels. This is again a misconception that remains amongst some Muslims based on the concept that they think that Iblis himself was an angel. And this is not true. As Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَفَسَقَ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِ He was from the jinn and he disobeyed the command of his Lord. So Iblis is, or the Satan himself, is a jinn and is not from the angels. As for Allah saying all of the angels prostrated except Iblis, this is a feature of Arabic which is very common in Arabic. We say all of the students left except the teacher. Um, you know, all of the, all of the, uh, the, the fans left the stadium except the players. This is a normal phrase in Arabic. It doesn't necessarily mean when you make an exception that the exception is from the body of the things that you've made the exception from. And so when Allah says all of the angels prostrated except Iblis, that does not mean that Iblis was an angel. And in fact, Allah says in the Quran, Kana min al jinn, he was from the jinn. Now we come on to what I think most people will have been wanting to hear about, which is the issue of jinn possession. Okay, jinn possession. And this is kind of what I deal with the majority of the time. But it is important if we're going to talk about the world of the jinn that you really know who you're dealing with. Otherwise it comes to jinn possession and you think, you know, half the people think it's their grandfather and half the people think that it's this supernatural being that can do anything to them and can control them at any time. Once we now know what the jinn are, it's very easy for us to take that small step and understand what jinn possession is. One of the abilities of the jinn is the ability to touch or to possess a person. Now in Arabic we call this mess, the touch of the jinn. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ said that the shaitan flows through the son of Adam like the blood or majr dam in the way that the blood flows or through the vessels that the blood flows. So the same vessels that carry your blood around your body, those can be inhabited by the jinn. And we know that the jinn inhabit or possess people because Allah says in the Quran, those who devour riba will, or usury will not stand on the day of resurrection except like the one who has been possessed by the shaitan leading him into insanity. So we know that possession is something that, that happens. Likewise, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, a child was presented to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said to the child, get out O enemy of Allah and I am the Messenger of Allah and he tapped the child or he struck the child in, in different places, there are different narrations on the chest, on the back and the jinn that was inside of the child left the child. A person is most vulnerable to possession at times when they are forgetful of Allah. At the end of the day, if our protection from the evil of the unseen is Allah, then when we forget Allah, that is a time when we're most vulnerable to being afflicted by possession. Times of extreme emotion, times of extreme anger, extreme joy, when we completely lose our senses. You know when someone gets so angry that they completely lose their senses, they lose their mind. And someone gets so happy that they completely lose their mind and they lose all control of themselves. This is the time when you are most vulnerable to being possessed. Likewise, you are vulnerable in places that are unclean or isolated. You know, places that are especially dirty, the bathroom, etc. Places that are especially isolated, walking in the woods at midnight, you know, these kinds of things. That doesn't mean that you are going to be possessed if you walk in the woods at midnight. Not at all. In fact, we have a dua or we have a supplication that we make that if you make it, you can go walk in the woods at midnight and I promise you nothing will afflict you. And that is, I'udhu bi kalimati min sharri ma khalaq. 
I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil which he has created. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever sets foot in a place and he says these words, he will not be harmed by anything until he leaves that place. So you have that option to say, I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil which he created. However, in general, when people are forgetful of Allah, they don't make their supplications, they are particularly unclean, they're not in a very state of, of purity or cleanliness, when they're particularly isolated, you know, walking down alleyways in the middle of the night, walking down, you know, in, in deserted places or unclean places, um, at the time of Maghrib, especially the Prophet ﷺ said, there is an hour after Maghrib when the shaitan spreads out across the earth. So keep your children indoors, close your windows and doors and keep your children in. Close your windows and doors and keep your children inside of the house. So at the time of Maghrib, an hour after Maghrib, an hour after sunset, around about that time. Likewise, people are vulnerable to possession when they what? When they call upon the jinn or when they seek help from the jinn. Ouija board. How many times have people been possessed by a jinn because they sought the help of the jinn with the Ouija board? So they took the Ouija board out, they thought they'd play a party game at night with their friends and then the board starts to move and then you see the person become possessed. And there are a number of videos of this on YouTube and I make it a bit of a, a hobby sometimes to watch a few of these videos on YouTube and see how many of them are actually real. But most of the ones of people being possessed by a Ouija board, the majority I've seen, they look to me to be absolutely real. I'm not saying all of them, but in general, they look to me to be absolutely real. And it's not difficult to imagine that someone might summon the jinn with candles or incense or sitting in a circle or chanting or reciting or Ouija board or whatever, calling upon the jinn, calling for the jinn to come, and then the jinn possess that individual. So at times of extreme emotion, at times when you're vulnerable and alone in places that are unclean or isolated, at times when you forget about Allah, you don't remember Allah, uh, at times when you are seeking help or calling upon the jinn or messing around with the jinn, these are all times when you can be afflicted. This is why we have dua to say when we enter the bathroom. Dua or supplication that we say uh, it before intimate relations. Dua that we say when visiting a new place. All of these du'as have one thing in common. Every single one of these du'as, the du'a for entering the bathroom, the du'a for relations between a man and his wife, the du'a for, uh, du for visiting a new place. All of these three du'a have one thing in common. All of these three supplications have one thing in common. They indicate to you or they mention being saved from the shaitan. So they indicate to you that these are times when you are vulnerable to being afflicted by the shaitan. So when you go in the bathroom, you say, Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from the male and female jinn. Al-Khubuthi wal khabaith the male and female jinn. So that's one thing, a time when you are vulnerable to them, so you seek refuge with Allah from them. When, again we mentioned, uh, at the time of intimate relations, a person says, Oh Allah, keep the shaitan away from me, and keep the shaitan away from what you provide us. Or keep the shaitan away from us and keep the shaitan away from what you provide us. Again, indicating it's a time when you forget about Allah. It's a time when you have extreme emotion. It's a time when you're neglectful of your religious duties. It's a time when perhaps you're in a state of uncleanliness or impurity. So it's a time when you say, oh Allah, keep the shaitan away from us. Likewise, when you visit a new place. I seek refuge with the perfect words of Allah from the evil which he created. Again, indicating that. The time or the place is a place where you are vulnerable. As for experience, the jinn inhabit all over the body. The jinn inhabit all over the body. But it's suggested that the jinn inhabit particularly in men, the artery in the neck. You get particularly the chest. And with women generally, you tend to particularly have the womb. And the lower abdomen, you tend to have general possession, signs of possession there. You get it all over the body, but this is the most common, if I was to say sort of, by far the most common, is that men tend to get in the artery, in the, the, the side of the neck, or compressions in the chest. Women generally, they tend to have, uh, it tends to inhabit, or they tend to inhabit the area of the womb and the lower abdomen. Also, they can inhabit the head, 
they can move around the body. Once you get into Rukia and you get into treating the jinn, you see them quite easily moving around. You see great big lumps, great big things stick out of people's skin and move all around the body. You can chase it and you know, tap it with your finger and so on and so forth. This is completely normal. This is something we see all, all the time when we're treating people. I had a very interesting discussion with a Muslim psychiatrist. Um, very, very in long and detailed discussion. I've actually met a few Muslim psychiatrists and had a long, detailed discussion. Obviously, we come from separate sort of angles. The psychiatrist, for the psychiatrist, every single one of the things that I'm describing is a psychiatric illness. Schizophrenia, bipolar, etc., etc. Whatever it is. You know, it's the manic depression, it's whatever. It's anything but jinn possession. And from my angle, or maybe from generally from a Rukia angle, Almost everything is a jinn problem. And I said, re realistically, that the answer is somewhat in the middle. And not every psychological illness that needs psychiatric treatment is a jinn problem by any, by any stretch of the imagination. But there are many that are misdiagnosed. And I said to him, in reality, what you see is you see the symptoms. You see that somebody hears voices in their head and you know how to treat these symptoms with uh, medicine that suppresses this sound or suppresses these feelings in a person but you don't actually know the underlying cause of the problem i said is that true or not that you don't really know the underlying cause of the problem you know that there is you know there are some problems in the brain and there are some protein deficiencies and this happens and that happens but you don't really understand it in a full and complete way so yeah i agree with you we don't fully we don't we understand the symptoms or we understand the the essence of it but we don't understand really you know, maybe the whole thing or, or we don't understand every single illness where it comes from. So I said, I'm just looking at the same illness from a different angle. I'm seeing the origin of the problem is the jinn and you're seeing the symptoms that the person is manifesting and treating those symptoms. And in general, I never have any problem with medical professionals treating people with jinn possession. I think, you know, if they can do anything for them, let them try, inshallah. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put some blessing in what they do and maybe they'll be given a cure from what the doctor gives them or the psychiatrist gives them. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But like he has his field and we respect him with his knowledge in that field, he should also respect the Raqi in his field and recognize that the person who performs Rukia sees things from a different angle and understands things from a different angle uh, to what he does. Why does possession occur? Why does jinn possession occur? There are several reasons why the jinn possess people. Um, not all of the jinn who possess people are evil. You often get Muslim jinn um, who possess people. Um, you often get jinn that are practicing Muslims who possess people. So why would possession occur? Usually there are three main reasons why possession occurs. One is in order to further the aims of the shaitan. So that can be magic, sorcery, misguiding people, taking people away from religion, whatever, it, something devilish, devilish reasons, you know, something that is to take people away from the path of Allah. The second, and this is very common, is if a person has harmed the jinn or their family. Now we know the jinn inhabit their world and we inhabit ours. But every now and again, we come across each other inadvertently. So for example, you're in the woods and you know, you go to relieve yourself against a tree and one of the jinn is sleeping under the tree. Now, how would you feel if somebody came up and you know, started to relieve themselves over you when you were lying down? You wouldn't be very happy about it. And so you'd likely react very aggressively and very angrily. And likewise, the jinn will do the same. You know, if you go into areas that are inhabited by the jinn and you inadvertently harm them, they may possess you out of anger. So, and this may be a Muslim jinn. Sometimes you say, how can you do this as a Muslim? Because one of the key principles of Islam is that we don't harm other people. How can you do this as a Muslim? He says, you know, it's not my fault, but this person, they did this to me. They, they poured boiling water over me, boiling oil over me. This was very common back in the day when we didn't have such a good drainage system and people used to go outside and, you know, pour boiling oil in the garden or pour boiling, oil, boiling water out of the window. These are examples of people who used to be possessed by the jinn. You know, one of the jinn is going past and he gets a vat of boiling oil poured over him. And, you know, they attack. Likewise, you know, they're inadvertently harming their children and so on and so forth. Likewise, we said that another reason or another common reason why possession occurs is love. So the jinn falling in love with 
uh, a human being following them around. I've had some of the worst cases of jinn possession because of love. What some of the worst cases? You know, the jinn is causing the woman severe pain. And I had one case, this poor sister, she was looking to get married. And every time someone came to her for a proposal, the person would suffer severe, severe pain and fitting. He would just come into the house and he would just drop down with severe, severe pain. And she said, you know, wasn't, you know the first time we thought, oh, subhanAllah, the poor brother's maybe sick. You know, he's got a medical complication. Took him out of the house, took him to the doctor. There went that proposal. Second guy comes for a proposal, drops flat down on the floor. Same thing. What a severe pain, complaining of shooting pains up and down the body, stabbing pains in the chest, uh, pains up and down, pins and needles up and down the arms, everything. Again, you know, maybe he's nervous. Third guy comes. <laughs> Third guy comes, exactly the same thing happens. By this time, they've established something is wrong. We read on the sister and it turns out that there was a male jinn with her and he said, I'm married to her, she's my wife. And I, if any of those guys come near to my wife, I'm going to cause them severe harm. So he was under the impression that he was married to her and he wasn't going to leave her and he had fallen in love with her. And that is, and again, you know, uh, something that is uh, quite common. All right, let's run through some of the common signs of possession. There are lots of signs of possession. But bear in mind, guys, that these signs are shared with many other illnesses and problems. So not everyone who displays these symptoms is possessed by a jinn. In fact, I'm going to mention symptoms almost all of us will have had in the past. But collectively, when they come all together, they are indicative of something perhaps being wrong. Perhaps being wrong. Perhaps, okay, being wrong. Again, I don't want... The reason... I'll give you an example. I'll give you an analogy. You go to the doctor and you say, Doctor, I've got a headache. You might need your eyes testing. You might have a brain tumour. There's a possibility of both. The doctor is going to diagnose you based on his or her knowledge and come to a conclusion as to whether you need your eyes testing or whether you need brain surgery or whether you need something in between. So don't be worried or concerned because you have or have had some of these symptoms. But in general, all of these symptoms together, when they come all together, they are indicative of a wider problem. Firstly, sudden rapid changes in personality and split personality. Rapid changes in personality, this covers things like schizophrenia, it covers things like bipolar. I personally do not believe that every case of schizophrenia is a gin possession, nor do I believe that every case of bipolar is gin possession. But if somebody is having severe personality problems, split personality, severe personality disorders, this is often an indication that there could be a jinn involved. There could be a jinn involved. A change in facial structure or voice. You really have to see this to appreciate just how it's like for someone's entire face to change completely. Their entire face to change such that you think you're looking at a completely different person. A man speaks with a woman's voice, a woman speaks with a man's voice. Again, I'm sure there's a doctor somewhere who specializes in you know, things with the throat and says, yeah, there's a medical condition that causes you to speak with the voice of a woman. I'm sure that's true. But there are also cases of a man speaking with a woman's voice, a woman speaking with a man's voice that are cases of jinn possession. Sudden displays of extreme emotion, often at inappropriate times. Laughing when everyone else is crying, crying when everyone else is laughing. These are examples. Again, it may be that you just have some issues and you need, you know, three, four days holiday. It may be that there are issues related to the jinn. An aversion or a reaction to the Qur'an or to the Adhan. So having a severe reaction or even a mild reaction to the Qur'an. Headaches when the Qur'an is being recited. Uh, feeling ill, feeling sick when the adhan is being read, fainting when you hear the Qur'an, vomiting when you hear the adhan, epileptic fits only when the Qur'an is recited. These are another, this is another key kind of factor. Sudden inexplicable illnesses. This is very, very common. Illnesses that just seem to be almost supernatural. They don't seem to fit into normal medical illnesses. For example, we had one sister... She was diagnosed with an ovarian cyst. That's fairly normal. Except that the cyst was moving in the body. 
around from place to place. So the, at first, the doctors thought that the, uh, the, the, the technician, when they did the scan, they put the film or the tape or whatever in the wrong way around. So they were like, but that's not right. Your, your, your cyst or your illness was on one side of the body and now it's on the other and then it's on the other and then it's on the other and it's moving up and down. These are, you know, these kind of weird, inexplicable illnesses. Complaints of, you know, ants crawling, heat in the body, feeling something in the throat, feeling something in the stomach, a sudden change in ability, such as being able to speak another language without any experience. We have the story of the Bedouin lady in Saudi Arabia who suddenly starts speaking fluent French, even though she's never ever been outside of the Badia, she's never been outside of her village in the middle of the desert, and she suddenly starts speaking fluent French. Severe compressions in the chest, epilepsy or fits and fainting, hallucinations, liking to be in places of filth, liking to be in extreme isolation, you know, hating to be with people, um, you know, even things like agoraphobia, like being terrified of going outside of the house and things like that, and extreme increased physical strength. Suddenly being able to, you know, lift up a car or something like that, you know, extreme physical strength. Briefly, just to finish off, because we only got a couple of minutes. I just want to talk about how interaction with the jinn goes wrong and the link between the jinn and magic. And I know I've kept you guys for a very long time. Jazakumullahu khairan for being so patient. But I do want to get through the whole set of materials. So what I want to just talk to you now for two minutes at the very end is interaction with the jinn and how it goes wrong. So we mentioned the ayah in Surah Al-Jinn about it increasing them in burden. And we mentioned the ayah in Surah Al-An'am that on the day of judgment, a company of jinn and men will say, We took advantage, some of us, from each other. So the means of seeking interaction with the jinn, going to seek them out in their places of abode, you know, going to sit in the far mountains, you know, for like days on end, waiting to see them, calling on them by their names, you know, calling, chanting their names and calling out to them. Uses of circles, candles, symbols, charts, Ouija boards, etc. Charts with, you know, squares on, circles with funny symbols in it. Whatever the people tell you it's Qur'an or whatever they tell you it is. In reality, anything like this is means of seeking interaction with the jinn. And within this, we see that interaction with the jinn is belittled in, even in modern culture. You know, if you see how... Children's stories talk about the genie that comes and answers your wishes. You know, you call upon it, you rub the lantern, and then the genie comes, that story of Aladdin and all that stuff, or Ala ad as it is in Arabic, uh, of the, the jinn that comes out. You know, I, I mean, in Arabic, this story is called Ala ad and the jinni. Ala ad and the jinni. Or Aladdin and the genie. I.e., this is a person who goes and seeks help from the jinn. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَزَادُوهُمْ رَحَقًا It increases them in sin and transgression. And Allah Azza wa Jal says that the fire will be their eternal abode. So it's very important that we don't get into this habit or this fall into this evil of even encouraging or even promoting seeking help with the jinn or working with the jinn in any single way. And this includes so-called good jinn. Why does this include so-called good jinn? Why is it so important? To emphasize this, there are loads of Muslims who you meet who say, yeah, yeah, you know my grandfather in Pakistan, he has control over the good jinn. They do things for him, they come and bring things for him, etc, etc. What is the problem with this? Let's just presume for a second that their grandfather is not a magician and he's not actually an evil person who is worshipping the devil or whatever. How might a person be fooled in this? It's very, very simple. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu in ja'akum fasiqun bi naba'in fatabayyanu. If a person comes to you with some news, make sure of it. How are you supposed to make sure of news that comes from someone you can't see? How do you know that's a Muslim? How do you know that's not a, a devil? How do you know that that is there to help you? How do you know it's a good jinn at all? How do you know it's not a devil? Ibn al-Qayyim tells a story that happened during his time said there was a man who was famous, the magician of his time, the kind of celebrity of his time. What made him famous is he used to fly to Hajj on a donkey. This is a true story. He, this was his kind of trick. 
You know, like, they, like you have these guys now and they suspend themselves in the air and they do all these things. His trick was he would descend from the air on a donkey. And that man, he was known for his piety, etc., etc., and for this donkey that he used to fly uh, on, to Hajj uh, on. And what happened is that man passed away and his son inherited the donkey. So along came Hajj time, his son climbed upon the donkey and said, Bismillah, let's go. <laughs> come on, let's go. Like, let's go, come on, let's go. The donkey turned around to him and spoke. Now, of course, it wasn't the donkey that was speaking. It was actually that donkey was possessed by a jinn. It was a jinn in the form of a donkey. And the jinn turned around and said to him, I will not fly to you or I will not fly for you until you do for me what your father did for me. He said, what did my father do, to do for you? He said, prostrate to me. So this is the reality of interaction with the jinn. This is the reality of the interaction with the jinn and this is the reality of the magician and how, the, how magic works. We're not here to talk about magic today, but just as a brief word at the end in the last 30 seconds, that magic is essentially the way that magic works. And I'm not talking about Harry Potter. I'm talking about real magic, sorcery, real evil devil worship. The way that this works is what they do is they call upon the jinn. They br use methods to bring the jinn. So they use incense or they sit in circles or they light candles to call the jinn. And then when they call the jinn over to them, they then begin to seek help from them and to prostrate to them, to bow to them, to worship them. And then they ask the jinn to do things for them and the jinn ask them to do things for them. So it's a pact of mutual loss. The shaitan asks to be worshipped and the magician asks for favors to be done. So the magician will say, go and kill this person. Go and possess this person. Make me fly through the sky. Make me do this, make me do that. The jinn will say, no problem, but you have to sacrifice to me. You have to do this, you have to do that, and you have to do the other. The ultimate aim of those jinn is to get as many people into the hellfire as possible. They want that magician to call other people to disbelieve in Allah, to call other people to the greatest sin, which is to make a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. And people who are afflicted by the uh, effects of sorcery and black magic, essentially this is the effect of the jinn that have been sent by the magician to afflict them uh, as part of this pact that the two uh, make. So that's a lot of information for you guys. Um, it's gone on for quite some time. So inshallah, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll close it off there inshallah. I'm personally got no problem with questions, but it's up to the guys inshallah in terms of uh, the organizers as to how much time we have inshallah. Uh, for me, it's no problem, but uh, that's inshallah at least a good introduction to the world of the jinn, to the possession of the jinn, reasons why it occurs, how you spot it. And we haven't had much time to talk about the cure, but I think inshallah, if you guys refer to uh, the website that I was telling you about there are a lot of lectures on there inshallah and a lot more information that you can get so we'll wrap it up there subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk was salatu was salam ala nabiyyina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa question number one have you seen someone being possessed by a jinn what did you do every week all the time that's what I do uh, as a hobby I uh, treat people who are possessed by jinn. And what you do is you recite the Quran over them. And inshallah, those of you, again, we didn't really have time to talk about the recitation, recitation of the Quran. But if you go to my website, inshallah, we'll be able to, you'll be able to watch loads of videos on how you treat someone, how you recite Quran over somebody. But in general, you want Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, you want to be reading Surah Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi. آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ If you recite these over people, inshallah, uh, this will be enough to protect you and your family from the jinn. Before sleeping, do you only need to read Ayatul Kursi once or more than once? No, you only need to read Ayatul Kursi once, wallahu a'lam. My daughter went to the toilet in Balmoral Woods near the river when she was one year old. Could she have been possessed? She has a split personality. Yes, I would say that there's definitely a cause to be looked at by somebody who's a professional in Rukia. 
uh, if there was a case where she went to a place where she was likely to be afflicted by the jinn and then she has a split personality disorder, there's no harm in being looked at. I mean, the treatment that we use is completely non-invasive. And that's what I said to the psychiatrist. I said to him, the treatment that I use of the recitation of the Quran is completely non-invasive. In other words, it doesn't cause any harm to anybody. It's just the recitation of the Quran, nothing else. So in this case, there is, you know, there's nothing wrong with having her seen by somebody who's a professional, inshallah, for them to determine whether she has a problem with the jinn or not, so that you can treat it in the most effective way, inshallah ta'ala. You mentioned how humans make contact with the jinn, but how do they communicate? They communicate in many different ways. The jinn speak to them. Sometimes the jinn come in human form. Sometimes the jinn come in animal form and they actually speak to them, like the example of the donkey who spoke. Sometimes the jinn speak whispers into their ears or put thoughts into their mind. Um, there are many, many different ways that they communicate. During your speech, an idea came to my mind to kill you. <laughs> Wasn't that bad. <laughs> Does it mean that I have a jinn? Again, the, you know, somebody who... See, you know, in, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, and I, I mean this in all seriousness, you know, if someone is having these kind of thoughts when they have the Quran being mentioned, or when they have, you know, someone talking about Islam, or someone talking about the jinn, then again, they should see somebody, inshallah, to make sure of it. It's not conclusive, you know, you may just want to kill me, you know, I may just be that kind of person. But, you know, it, it could well be, you know, it could well be. I've had people who say, whenever you speak about the jinn, I have a burning desire to run out of the room. And I, I want to put my fingers in my ears. And that again is another symbol of someone who has a problem with the jinn. Does hijama or cupping remove the jinn? Yes, cupping can remove the jinn. And cupping is from the beneficial cures that we do a lot of to remove the jinn. It, I'm not going to go into explaining what cupping is because we're short on time. But inshallah, you can Google it, hijama or cupping. Can you train to be a Raqi? Yes, you can train to be a Raqi. Alhamdulillah. Um, you can train to be a Raqi. And I have a Raqi training course on YouTube. So you can watch that, inshallah. Um, the verses of the Quran, the chapters were not stated. I apologize for not stating the reference for all of them. <coughs> um, but it, the time is very, very short. So what I will do is ask you to just refer back to, again, the website, inshallah, where things are explained in more detail, and inshallah, the verses and the chapters, etc. should all be on there. Um, what does it mean when a star falls from the sky? We're told that when a shooting star falls from the sky, this is an example of the jinn being shot at by the heavens, and an example of the jinn who were seeking to listen to the heavens, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shoots them, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attacks them with a star. Do the jinns have names as humans have names? Yes. You come across a lot of them written, written inside of ta'weez. When people get ta'weez made, and inside of the ta'weez you see written the names of the jinn, loads of different names of the jinn. And some of the names of the jinn relate to the seven stars of Babylon, and some of them relate to the ancient gods of Egypt, and all sorts of things like that. Sorry, Sheikh. When you said ta'weez, what's your opinion of ta'weez? Okay, very briefly on the topic of ta'weeth, again I'll refer you to the website where I have a detailed article on ta'weeth. But it's enough for us that the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ تَعَلَّقَ تَمِيمَةً فَقَدْ أَشْرَكْ Whoever ties a ta'weeth has committed shirk, has made a partner with Allah. So that's enough inshallah for us to, to mention. And on the website there's a detailed explanation of ta'weeth and, and some of the issues regarding ta'weeth. I've opened several hundred ta'weeth. And of those several hundred, most of the people when they come, they promise me it's, it's, oh, it's Qul Hu Allah Hu Ahad, it's Ayat Al Kursi, and they promise me if they open them that, you know, and I say to them simple, I'll do you a deal. You give me your ta'weez, I'll open it. If it's Surah Al Fatiha, Ayat Al Kursi, Qul Hu Allah Hu Ahad, I'll give it back to you. I've only given back about two or three out of several hundred. Most of them have Iblis, 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 help me, Iblis, help me, Iblis, help me. It's Qul Allahu Ahad. It's an ayah from the Quran. You open up, it says Iblis, help me. 
I've got videos of them on YouTube, just opening them up and written inside is Iblis, 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 Iblis. And this person thought they were carrying around, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Can a jinn be in and out of a person when they are angry? No doubt, jinn sometimes go in and out of a person and don't stay inside of a person all of the time. It's not, an, it's not a case that if you're possessed, you're possessed until you're cured. Sometimes the jinn move in and inside and outside of a person. Is it possible that a child who's been good in study and turns totally opposite may have a problem? This is more likely to be the evil eye and Allah knows best. And again, if you refer to the website, there's a lot of information on the evil eye there. Mostly, yeah, I would say the, the example of the person who wrote this question, it sounds very much like the evil eye and Allah knows best. How does a person uh, be suddenly possessed and then claim that they can help cure a patient or a sick person? Um, is this person doing shirk? Uh, that's kind of a complicated question, but uh, you know, it's not a, a, a raqi or a person who treats someone should never claim that they cure anybody. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that cures by the recitation of the Quran, by the words of Allah, by dua that the person is cured, not by the raqi. Anyone who says, I cure people, you know, you ask them, what do you mean? Do you mean you treat people or you mean you cure people? But if they persist and say, I cure people, I'm a curer, I bring the cure, then it's not permissible for them to do this. And this is making a partner with Allah because one of the names of Allah is Ash-Shafi, that Allah is the one who cures. If you feel you've been afflicted with black magic, how can you locate the, 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 the ta'weed if it is hidden? Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are four things one of my teachers once said. If these four things don't help you, nothing will help you. The first is that you make a lot of tawbah. You repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. You repent for the things that you've done. The second is to do a lot of optional prayer to pray in the night, to pray in the times when your dua is answered. The third is to make dua, uh, to call upon Allah in times of need, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His greatest names, to do all of the things that make your uh, dua be accepted and so on and so forth. And you know, he mentioned another one, but he said that if these things are here, if you have a person who is praying and they're supplicating and they're making, asking Allah to forgive them, and they're doing their best to change the situation, then inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help them and will help them to locate the problem that they have. And if you can't locate a ta'weed, you can still treat a person by reciting the Quran over them. Is it allowed for a raqi to do ruqya for a non-Muslim? Yes, by consensus of the scholars, with no disagreement, it's allowed for a raqi to do ruqya for a non-Muslim. Why is it that the jinn attack more women than men? I think that's true. You know, I get more cases, more women cases than men. Allahu alam. I, I don't know. Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Is the shaitan the first jinn like Adam being the first man? This is an opinion of some of the scholars and Allah knows best. It is an opinion and there is some evidence for it in the Quran. So it seems to be, I mean, there's, a, there's a possibility that Iblis is the father of the jinn and Allah knows best. If you're a shaitan, do you know that you're a shaitan? As in from the human beings. If you're, yeah, because a shaitan is not a person who has some evil in them. We all have some evil in us, right? <inaudible> the soul is constantly inclined towards evil. Everyone has some evil in them. But a shaitan is a person who has nothing but evil in them. Like as in, they've reached such a level of evil and transgression that they are essentially just evil. You know, there is no good left they're not they're not a person that has any good left in them um, and if you are possessed are you aware of it at the time not always but usually you'll be aware of some symptoms that will you know ring some bells basically is it true that the jinn overtook this world before the humans and they had their own judgment day as for the first bit it's true as for the second no it's not um, so yes the jinn were on this earth before the humans were on this earth and that's an opinion that has some evidence based on the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the spilling of blood on the earth uh, to the angels that this was from the jinn who inhabited the earth before the angels. So it has some evidence for it. But the jinn, they will be judged on the same day that we will be judged. On the same judgment day that we will be judged. 
If you see some signs in a person of possession, what can you do? Again, in this is, it's too long for us really to discuss at this time. Uh, how can you be sure a person is possessed or has a mental illness or needs a medical solution? First of all, don't delay seeking a medical solution. There's nothing wrong with going to a doctor or psychiatrist, inshallah. So you shouldn't delay in doing so. But inshallah, by the recitation of the Quran and by seeing someone who has an expertise in the field, you can tell. Again, I've covered this in a lot of detail on my website and I've covered it in a lot of detail on other YouTube videos. So I don't want to cover it now because we'll, it's, it's a long, long, long topic. But inshallah, I'll refer you to the videos for that. You mentioned that jinn can possess humans. Could you give me the source where this is mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith? It's mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. In, I know the ayah, but I don't know the ayah number. I, I had it on my computer somewhere. Um, the ayah about riba, the ayah about uh, usury. It's also mentioned in the Musnad of Al Imam Ahmed, and it's also mentioned in uh, the books of the Sunan, the four Sunan, in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that the shaitan flows through the blood of the children of Adam like blood. Again, more than this, you'll have to email me, inshallah. And uh, if you can email me, inshallah, then I can probably, you know, give you the exact references. Is sleepwalking due to jinn activity? It may be due to jinn activity. It may not be. It's again, it's one of those things that if you sleepwalk, you should get yourself seen and you should get yourself read Quran upon, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to try and get through as many of these as possible. The brothers want me just to take a couple more, but I think we can just fly through them very quickly. Uh, what can you say about autism? Allahu alam, I haven't read upon anyone who has autism, so I couldn't say whether some people who have autism have jinn related problems or not. I haven't read upon someone with autism. There are selected ayat. Can we read Rukia for regular everyday reading? Yes, you can read it for whatever you want. Regular medical illnesses, just feeling down, just to protect yourself. What's the difference between al nafis or al nafs and the jinn? And nafs is the soul, the soul that is the essence of every person. And the jinn are, as we have described, again, I apologize for the short answers, but I want to get through all of them. Difference between ruqya and treatment of good shaykhs, again, I've covered this online, it's too detailed. But in general, if somebody is treating just with the Quran, and they are attributing the cure to Allah, and they're not asking you to do weird and wonderful things, they don't ask for your mother's name, they don't ask for clothing or sacrifices or anything like that, then in general, they're probably okay. Do the jinn see the angels? Yes. They must have stronger belief. Not necessarily because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if they saw every ayah, they would not believe. And not about the jinn, but in general about people who don't believe. Allah azza wa jalla says if we, if we showed them every ayah, they would not believe. So it doesn't necessarily mean because you see the angels that you have a stronger belief than human beings. What are the chances that a possessed person will die? Some of them do. And a non-Muslim curing the jinn. There are non-Muslims who do quite a decent job, i.e. they don't make a partner with Allah, they don't seek help from the jinn, like the brother Michael that I was telling you, he used to treat people with jinn possession before he became a Muslim, and he used to try and do his best to convince them to leave, to, to, to give them things they don't like, to feed them water that they didn't like, and so on. He tried his best, you know, with what he knew at the time, but there's no doubt that it's very limited what you can get from someone who can't read the Quran. Um, as you know, Allah created the jinn's world before human beings. Did Allah send messages and prophets to jinn's? Yes, we said we covered this in the lecture that He sent messengers and prophets to the jinn's. Do Muslim jinn's hurt human beings? They can do, just like Muslims can hurt human beings. I mean, there are bad Muslims, good Muslims, practicing Muslims, non-practicing Muslims, Muslims with short tempers, Muslims who are very patient. The jinn are the same. Could you please share an experience that stood out for you? I'll leave that one inshallah because I, I want to answer the other questions. I, there's so many, you know, it just, they just all blur into each other. Do you know if jinn are used for hypnotherapy or is that a different way for mind control? Allahu alam, I don't know because I haven't seen hypnotherapy being done and I shouldn't speak about something I haven't seen, seen being done. But it's not difficult to imagine that it might be relating to the jinn. You mentioned all the devils are not the jinn. So if some devils are jinn, then what about the other devils? They're human beings, devils from the human beings. Allah says, Shayateen al insi wal jinn. Shayateen, from the human beings and from the jinn. Can you tell the ruling about people who believe in fortune telling and go there? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever goes to a fortune teller and does not believe in him, not believing in him, just goes purely for the entertainment. He will not have his prayer accepted for 40 days. 
and whoever goes there believing in them has disbelieved in what was revealed to Muhammad. So reading your fortunes, if you read your fortunes in the newspaper, you watch it on TV, your prayers and accept it for 40 days. If you believe in it, you're not a Muslim. How commonly are people afflicted by the evil eye? There is some hadith that indicate that most people will be afflicted by the evil eye, that most people will die from the evil eye, and Allah knows best. How does the fortune teller hear the whisperer from the devil? The devil comes down and whispers into their ear physically, or they get impressions or thoughts, or you know how you get the mediums who say, I can sense a presence and it's telling me, it's telling me. These are all examples of this. And the final question, can you cure yourself from the jinn? Yes. You can cure yourself and this should be your first port of call if you're able you know if you're a hafiz of the quran or you have good memorization of the quran and you have strong iman and you want to treat yourself then that should absolutely be the first port of call because the prophet ﷺ mentioned seventy thousand people who will enter paradise without any account and any punishment and he said they are those who do not seek other people to do ruqya for them so this doesn't mean that it's haram to seek people to do ruqya for you but it means that if you want to be from the highest highest levels of paradise and you have the ability that's a condition you have to have the ability it's no good saying I don't know how to read the Quran and I'm going to treat myself or I'm not strong enough or every time I read I, I fall on the floor you have to ask someone else to help you but if you're in the state where you're strong and able to help yourself and you want to trust in Allah and do that that is better than asking somebody else okay guys I kept you for a very very long time Jazakumullahu khairan for your patience. Have you ever wished that there was a Muslim version of YouTube or Netflix? Well, we have created one. The One Islam TV app has no adverts and is safe to browse for your peace of mind. Watch hundreds of high quality produced Islamic reminders, Quran videos, stories of the prophets, hot topic, debates, and so much more. Four to eight new videos are uploaded daily, inshallah. You can watch or listen to videos while your device is switched off. Watch videos on demand or download videos and watch offline. One Islam TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means the small amount you pay for your subscription is a sadaqa jariyah, continuous charity for you, as we use the funds raised to continue producing more beneficial videos and reminders, inshallah. The One Islam TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku. So you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 7-day trial. May Allah reward you for supporting our work.